today, American Cider, a Modern Guide to a Historic Beverage. Sounds interesting. Sounds <laughs> delicious, too. Craig Cavella lived in New York City for 13 years, working in restaurants, blogging about food trends, and writing for The Savior. Um, his work has been published in Condé Nast, Traveler, GQ Magazine, New York Magazine's Grub Street, Thrillist, and Vice Munchies. Okay. Uh, he left New York City for the Hudson Valley, where he now owns and operates Golden Resort Cafe and Grocery with his wife, Jenny. And uh, when he's not there, he's, uh, you can find him out picking apples and dabbling in his own cider experiments. Okay. So our other speaker is Dan Pucci. Pucci. Okay. I can do a number on that word, uh, that name. Dan is one of the nation's leading cider experts. He was the founding beverage director of Wasail, New York City's first cider bar and restaurant, and has since traveled the country uh, in a continued pursuit of cider education, awareness, and research. He's a partner in the Wall About Hospitality, a New York City-based consulting and hospitality company. So with no further information from Cynthia or me, please welcome Dan and Craig. So on, on Zoom here, I have a really awesome sheepskin I'm sitting on here, which is a really nice touch. So the pilot seat. It's very cozy for, for a nice fall night. Um, Cynthia and Barbara, thanks so much. Clinton Historical Society. Thank you very much for, uh, for approaching me and thereby Dan for your interest in apples and in, in the history of uh, those things in cider kind of in the country. And we'll kind of focus here, New York and the Hudson Valley. Uh, folks at home, thanks for tuning in. We are honored to be part of the first hybrid go-round here. Um, and speaking on behalf of Golden Russet, the venue, we uh, aspire to be part of the community in a greater sense of just feeding folks. And so this is a, a great feat for us, and we're happy to be here and, and have you and have your interest. Um, Dan and I are dear friends. We met in the city. Uh, just kind of a, a quick background on how the book came to be. Um, we worked in beverage and hospitality and restaurants. About 10, 10 12 years ago. And uh, Dan in his restaurant with sale that was opened in New York City, coincidentally, on Orchard Street, put together a program, a very dynamic program of just cider from around the world, uh, largely focusing on the country. And Dan was tapped into this national network of cider makers and producers and drinkers and, and farmers and people on, on all spectrums of, uh, of cider. And, and it, it sort of captivated him as many things do. Um, and so the idea for the book was largely his, and I had experience writing, and he invited me on the project. We fell very deeply down the rabbit hole together, and in so many words, we're all here together now. Um, I, I think it's really amazing. It's, um, the cider community, the apple community, is a really strong and rich community here. Uh, I, both of us came from a restaurant and, and beverage background and a wine background, and um, approaching cider through that lens was really important to us, uh, but like the community and, and the organizations and the knowledge, the information, and the discovery that's taking place within this community is is unlike anything else, and it's it's pale as a compare. It's there's so much to explore and so much to learn and so much to we're still figuring out that it's it's it keeps me going, keeps me excited every time, and uh, it's really an amazing, unique. Um, it's not like anything else I've encountered in terms of how deep that rabbit hole go, how deep that rabbit hole goes, and how directly impactful what we're doing now has in that exploration. So it's been it's really amazing and really and and it's equal parts learning about the past and then applying those lessons and 
understanding what the future might hold for us. So it's very dynamic. And that's in large part the goal of the book was to kind of contextualize ciders growing at a very meteoric rate. There's something like a sevenfold increase 10 years ago. There's, I think, I think the one, one figure we had to look at like 1990, there's like 10 cideries in the United States. And today there's over a thousand. There's one in every state in the country, Hawaii, deep south, everywhere. Um, ciders being made and consumed and there's, there's a growing market for it. Around the world. And with the book, I sort of, a, a place that I tend to start and it may be redundant information is just kind of how apples got here. Um, why, why they continue to persist and why they're, why there's such a, a dynamic culture around them. Available for sale where books are sold, yeah, also <laughs> here at Golden Nusset. Um, so the, the, the apple starts in Central Asia, uh, kind of the mountains of Kazakhstan, and it starts moving west with civilization. Uh, of course, this is thousands of years ago. Uh, it, it ends up, this is succinct for the sake of time, it ends up in Europe with Romans, and then of course Europeans bring it to the coast here in, in the United States. I was going to show you, in our book also we have these amazing maps. This is their map of the Midwest. They're kind of done as like, um, as like very Tolkien-esque young adult fiction style maps. Uh, are really the way that, that they kind of, they're more narrative maps and like I wouldn't drive off them because they're definitely not <laughs> accurate. But they're very fun in terms of engaging, telling a story of, telling a story that we want, we want to tell in the book. And, sorry, yeah, apples, come here. So Kazakhstan. The book is structured regionally, so we, we start sort of where um, where Europeans landed in the southeast and then move to New England, New York, work our way west, kind of the, in a way the book front to back is a, it's a history of the United States told through the Apple's lens, it's broken into regions, um, and then it is sort of contextualized, we don't tell a 400 year and then 300 year history of Definitely these, not comprehensive. these regions, um, but to kind of better understand and digest the information we broke it apart regionally um, but all of these regions have very distinct cultures we found in talking to people over 100 people excuse me uh, that people are facing the same problems and there's there's a lack of of information a lot of information is tied up in bigger agriculture wine and beer industries are far more significant than cider uh, so it's it's very much kind of uh, it, it's growing but it's still a grassroots kind of movement everybody's kind of pushing forward uh, in the same time and, and kind of amazing it's amazing how grassroots it is and kind of in, and in the diversity of places that exist in the country. So like we're thinking about with Hudson Valley, which is a penultimate apple center thing, but also in places like uh, Southwest Colorado, Northern Michigan, North Dakota, Montana, all these amazing places part of, the, part of the country that all have a rich and unique apple history and hopefully future that's to come. Of things that are, are going are, are not yet to pass, but but we can see we can see some goals in light, which are which is really exciting to see. Um, apples don't grow true from seed, so as they're brought here and they land on the coast, they grow. They're very resilient. They can grow in a lot of environments. They grow in the mountains of the southwest. They grow here. They grow in the upper reaches of, of Minnesota and Michigan where it's, you know, below 30 in winter. Um, but that's partly why the Dutch, the early settlers up and around the Hudson were, were keen observationists. They saw this, they knew that apples were thriving and other, other fruits, stone fruits. Um, well, Alexander, what's the guy's name? Um, there was gentleman Adrian Vanderdonk acting as the sort of lawyer and ethnographer for the Rensselaerwick colony of Fort Orange. Um, was an early documentarian of this stuff, sort of middle 17th century, uh, and took note of how well apples do. There, there's an apple that's still around, but not on a commercial scale called Swar, S-W-A-A-R, and translates to heavy in Dutch, and it was an apple that grew uh, very commonly around the Hudson Valley that was large and heavy uh, and named thusly, but yeah, I was going to add, like, in, in his notes, he, recommends, he acknowledges how, how well uh, the tree fruit does here comparatively to it, to, to it at home. He's like, and their, the tastes are remarkable, and he has all these great things to say. And then when the English took over, the English had the same things to say. And um, 
the remarkability of the fruit, the high fruit quality comparatively to what was being grown in Europe at the time. And I think what's interesting then is that apples nativize, can like, nativize themselves to the Northeast and throughout most of the country. Uh, as Europeans cut down old forests and basically clear cut stuff, new things grew up in its past, which is why we have all these amazing old wild trees that still exist out in the, in the woods. Because, because as the old forests came down, new forests came up and the apples insert themselves into that into that new uh, that new landscape pretty seamlessly. So we create this huge diversity of, of, of apple variety things. But we have something like 14,000 uh, apple varieties that are indigenous in, to, to North America, or have been grown in North America. A crazy number. The species of Malus domestica, which is the apple that we eat in grocery stores, or many of the wild trees growing here, is not native to the country. But uh, crab apples were, and they, they were grown in there's evidence of Native American cultures having grown these fruits less in an orchard setting. That was something that was learned from the Europeans. Um, and not, not really for, uh, for, never for fermentation. So what happened in, in the Hudson Valley in New York is kind of a microcosm for the rest of the country is early settlers are here. Um, it's very, it's rugged, it's hard, it's, it's dire. Uh, people are setting up homesteads, they're clearing land. And without fail, people are planting orchards because it's something, it's a crop that does well. You plant a seed, it grows, it's perennial. You harvest it once, there's little maintenance. It's not like something that requires a lot of labor or people. And then add to that, doesn't need necessarily the best land either. Sure, yeah, it can rocky soil and so that, yeah, so you, if you have- Marginal land is often, yeah, left for-, for You have your, ni your nice, your nice, you know, fields that are gonna be planted to field crops, like grains and things like that. And then you have row crops for other, for other land, for better land and like, but like you don't necessarily need, you can have pretty crappy soil and your tree crops can do just fine. So you, the, the crick said there's no maintenance to it or no work to it. It's just have trees growing on your kind of sparse hilly sides and you can be totally fine. And seeds are light and portable. And this was at a time nobody was really grafting. There were some uh, members of aristocracy and of people of means and money who had access to the skill set of grafting, which if you're unfamiliar is the way that we kind of a lot happened from these, you know, backwoods homestead orchards to commercial orchards of thousands of trees on hundreds of acres. But the key to getting an apple, these here on the table and folks at home, um, we have a few that have been commercially relevant at varying stages. Uh, this is Jonathan. This apple originates across the river in, uh, in Ulster County, about 1820s. But this is the one of the parents of John Mac, John Alicious, John Gold. Uh, this was so, okay, yeah, one of the most prolifically bred apples, and one of one, yeah one of the most commercially relevant at the turn of the 20th century. Uh, Golden Russet, the namesake of the cafe here, is believed to have originated in New York. Somewhere, you know, I don't believe that. In the early 1800s, we're not going to verify that. Well, that'll be a next segment. Um, Roxbury Russet is believed to be the first named variety from like 1630s or so from Roxbury, Massachusetts. So very old. Um, but, but but the way we commercially grow these things is that, like I said, you can't grow apples from most tree fruit. You can't grow from seeds. So you have to literally have to ta ta take the the, 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 the tree, the, the scion wood, the, and attach it to a different tree. And that way you're basically cloning it, you're creating a clone of the same thing. You're creating, you're creating new or creating, you're grafting the old organism onto a new organism, basically. Uh, and we have rootstocks that are basically, the roots are, Bred for certain properties, so that's that's why this apple that is, was first grown in Massachusetts four years ago can you know can still exist today and be continue to be propagated. And I think the oldest varieties out there from um, it's a Court Penduplat, which is like a 1300s Northern French apple, they grow some over in um, an orchard over in Highland grows 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 some of it, uh, but you know it's a 1320s in France. It's amazing that you can grow here as well. Spectacular. You want to, and then I, I have one more thing about um, early stuff before you get into that. And, um, it's really interesting about about, um, about cider here. No, never mind. Craig, you go into your, your local history and then we'll, well come yeah, back to it. Easy into it. Um, Sorry for the rough transition, everyone. Um, the earliest nursery endeavors oh, right, right. Uh, in New York um, started 1730 in Long Island in modern-day modern Queens, Prince Nursery. Um, 
was sort of disseminated fruit and to, you know, as people started moving west into the local local community, they were uh, very significant in sort of protecting, uh, preserving and just sort of encouraging growing of, of fruit trees. Yeah, it's a really like a couple of nurseries out in, out in what's now, um, what's now Elmhurst and, and Jamaica, in, in Jamaica, Queens that, um, that were basically central to basically this East, this exchange across the Atlantic exchange between, uh, na native, uh, plants to this continent and, and heading to Europe and then European plants coming here and going that kind of exchange back and forth. It's kind of the same, that kind of is the same kind of point of like, uh, Linnaean botany and kind of the origination of these kind of Aggregation of, of, of plants kind of all happens at the same time, and it's really kind of a unique microcosm. But anyway, from there you get to where you kind of get all these European varieties of apples come in, and it's kind of where American apples go back to Europe. All right, you can continue. Um, this it was very prolific to see this organization and this centralized effort to grow something that for the previous century was was a, just a challenge. But the fact that Prince Nursery could establish itself and succeed suggests that uh, there's there's a growing education around agriculture in this you know this still fledgling not yet country um, but here this sort of idea moves a little bit west and comes to Dutchess not Dutchess County sorry the greater Hudson River um, in Esopus Robert Livingston Pell in about 1830s opened what is the first commercial orchard uh, in the United States and the Hudson Valley boasts the the, the rightful claim of being the home of commercial orcharding in the country, um, partly because of a centralized population that hadn't quite dispersed west through the frontier, but also Pell's access. Uh, he was right, the orchard was right on the water. Um, Easy shipping. Access to shipping. Uh, and a lot of people, as they were moving west, 1830s, the Erie Canal is 10 years old at this point, give or take. Um, people have access to move west and move west. They do in abundance and they take ideas with them. Uh, we can sort of segue largely sort of, and this is, we'll, we'll debunk a few myths, prohibition being one of them, but uh, as ideas are moving west, the idea that prohibition killed cider, this, and this will debunk. We'll get to that. Uh, as ideas start moving west, they're largely rooted in the Puritan values that sort of founded New England. Um, People are moving west. You start to see urban centers developing. You start to see mill towns. Uh, you start to see a centralized workforce. You start to see the industrialization of a product being finished under one roof by multiple people instead of a single person doing uh, all of the entities. As this workforce develops and strengthens, um, there's sort of a need to ensure a reliable workforce. A drunk workforce cannot be productive. And this is sort of one of the reasons and maybe an early uh, one of the early sort of dings towards cider losing popularity in culture is because temperance was boasted as this thing that, in, you know, it, it was a way to jump the hurdle of an, uh, an irrelevant workforce, so to speak. Yeah, and I think top onto that too as well. Like we talk about Pell being the first or first commercial orchard in the, in the United States over here in the Sopas. Uh, we mean it's like professional, like having a full-time staff and and really like focused on growing apples for commercial resale. But he was in the for wholesale for fresh eating. So what he was doing is he was growing apples, mostly apple variety called the Newtown Pippin, which is, we don't have, they're not picked yet, so we don't have any here. Um, but it's a, the apple variety that originates in Newtown, in, um, was Newtown, uh, New York, which is now Elmhurst, Queens. Um, and it, he basically, the apple variety was basically, it was valued because it's, Pretty late, har pretty late harvested. We don't pick them here until uh, like a couple of weeks. Like a couple of weeks, probably end of the month. Um, even feeling like I don't push them even until November, and they will. Um, and they they last in storage for a very long time. So, held made a lot of money exporting those apples to the UK and to, and to the rest of Europe. Um, so they would last the boat. They he would eat them in the UK in January or February or things like that. That's how he made his. That's how he made his money. So when you're dealing with selling fresh apples, um, cider cider made sense if you're a subsistence farmer making making stuff out out, out by yourself, and it made sense if you're um, have some trees on the hillside and you harvest them. You can't eat those apples for yourself; they don't taste very good. 
So you can just press them and make cider and drink that. But if you're having a large scale commercial orchard here, like quickly that cider is no longer commercially viable to sell, to sell people cider anymore. It doesn't make any sense. Like, so money in that you make much more money selling people fresh apples, which is what it is today. So, so people make more money selling selling you fresh fruit to consume than it would selling you, uh, selling you fresh uh, applesauce or something like that. Um, so um, as a result, like as we were saying, as commercial orchards spread across the country, um, cider never really became a part of that kind of that relationship. There are, for a brief point in time, there are places in the country, um, places like parts of Santa, of, um, Santa Cruz, parts of Newark, New Jersey, which was like the apple cider, hard cider capital of the country for many for, for many years, um, where they still produce, produce cider. But for the large part, as orchards, as we know them today, commercial entities started. Cider never really developed as part of that relationship, mostly because of economics, because it didn't make any sense. Like the, the money wasn't there to support anyone having temperance aside. Temperance, temperance aside, people also weren't drinking drinking alcohol, but also um, like it, the money didn't make sense to do so either. Um, so the only place it makes sense like in California, where things were a little bit more loose um, during the gold rush, like there was alcoholic cider. People were actually shipping cider from New Jersey to California at that point in time, but cider never really developed as part of that. So when, so like right now we read all these, right now kind of in the peak cider article world, uh, where like every Lots mag cider headlines, like yeah, we create, we send each other, send each other all the every paper has a cider article this week, um, and a lot of them reference Echo chamber, sort of, and they, yeah, and they all and they all kind of reference a lot. Of, this year has been less bad, but always, always people always reference how prohibition killed cider. And frankly, like no one drank it for fifty years <laughs> before prohibition, so it wasn't like it was like people were breaking down cider stills and chopping down cider orchards when prohibition happened. Like yeah, we, did, we didn't, there were no cider orchards shut down in the first place. We didn't come across any evidence of orchards being raised or destroyed during during prohibition. No, they never happened in the first place. No one planted them. There's um. And we, we sort of start, cider becomes this nostalgic thing. There, there's the, the trend in humanity to kind of do something different from your parents. So if, if you were raised in the woods uh, by, by struggling farmers and you have means to get out and maybe go work the mill, you're, you might do that. And you're going to look at cider as this thing that your parents did as bygone. And now maybe in the Midwest, they're growing grain and new rail systems are shipping that grain back to your mill town where it doesn't spoil and you can make beer in two two days or two weeks and not have to wait for a whole season to, to ferment for cider. So in, in one regard, beer became a much more common beverage. But uh, in the book, we, we sort of, to the point about prohibition, not really killing cider. In 1840, William Henry Harrison, uh, presidential election running against gentleman Marvin Van Buren from Kinderhook here in the Hudson Valley. Um, Harrison took the road of the the everyman. Uh, he came from wealth, but he sort of put on put on an air of log cabin and hard cider uh, when he was speaking at rallies and, and saying like I'm you know I can relate I'm with you. But Marvin Van Van Buren owns that that title, um, but it's sort of seeing cider being referenced in popular culture 90 years before prohibition suggests that the beverage is already kind of not. It was viewed very nostalgically in that yeah. election. Yeah. So it's sort of we're spending some time on it because it bothers us when we see stories of people just taking the easy road and saying prohibition did it, but it's not the case. It's many other things culturally. Um, right, let's take in some local 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 sure. jobs. Yeah, yeah. So there's and this all rabbit holes are deep. I found it's amazing to see how much information and and how much concern and care and passion there is in preserving history in all facets. In this case, apples and cider. But um, Craig Marshall who is here, turned me on to a family, the Hart family, who started a, an orchard in 1830s in the Grange. Um, in 1837, Benjamin Hart moved from Long Island and bought 150 acres and started an orchard. Um, in 1838, I think maybe finished the home, called it Hartsies, and it operated up through 1962, I believe is when it ceased operation. But this is, Hart was starting his orchard kind of around the same time across the river is Pell, and presumably Pell, because of the means and the better access to shipping, he seemed to have an easier go. Um, in 1850, there's evidence of Benjamin Hart setting sail for 
Uh, the gold rush, he went twice, 49 and 50, and both times didn't strike gold. He came back. Uh, but on the second journey, he brought a bunch of dried apples with him from his farm, a, a way to preserve the, the harvest, dry the fruit. It tastes great. It's lightweight. And in going through Panama, he ended up selling all the fruit for 37 cents a pound because it was delicious. And it was kind of a, this exotic thing uh, in Central America. Um, but he, his son ended up taking over, William, uh, William Hart, in 1875 upon his death. Um, and as each generation took over, uh, they sort of start to implement newer ideas. Uh, Hart had, I forget how many sons, but after the Civil War, the eldest moved to Florida and they actually started an orange grove in Federal Point. Um, William stayed behind, who was too young. He was born in maybe 53, I guess he was about 18 when his, when his dad passed. Um, but he, he took the orchard and started to champion the distribution of the fruit and he managed, it was sort of his responsibility to get fruit to sloops to then be sent down to the city, to the market that sort of had long sustained orchardists in the Hudson Valley, the access to the market developing city in, in New York. Um, but it's, it's, it's a long history. Uh, I, it's a continuing education on my behalf. I'm gonna continue learning and folks that might have answers would be happy to chat with you at length. Um, William Hall Hart, Benjamin's son, bought 35 acres around the turn of the 20th century and named it the Klondike Orchard, perhaps in reference to his dad's ambitions of finding gold, uh, but planted 35 more acres of fruit, kind of believing in learning and understanding that homological societies, horticultural societies are doing the work and they're beginning to know more and more. So double down, plant more fruit. Um, and that he did. Northern Spy, Baldwin, Rhode Island Greening were the main varieties at the time. Um, around the same time, the first real uh, invasive species attacked the orchard and many other across the country and was sort of uh, symbolic of of small scale orchards shutting down and, and only the larger players could sustain due to sheer volume of trees. But the San Jose scale uh, was the first insect that proved to be almost unstoppable. unstoppable. It landed in 1870s in California on flowering peaches that came from China and then it found its way all over orchards all over the country. And so small players, which was once a common thing, part of you know the, the rural countryside, so to speak, uh, they were just squashed, they couldn't survive. And the large players, at commercial scale are the ones left growing fruit and largely to the day that's part of the reason on this legacy of of volume consolidation is 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 why uh you know lar large orchards or are, are that's a good segue though into this into this idea so so uh like one of the big questions is like why now like why is cider having a thing it's always the thing we always get asked um, like we have a thousand ciders in the United States now, back from like a hundred decade ago. To Dan's point, it wasn't created in a boardroom, right? But but but, but, but like, where, where that, what, why is that happening? And, and that's happening because like apples have had a really hard time for the last fifty hundred years. Um, you talk talk back to um, Steve Wood, who's one of the founding cider makers in the United States in the in the eighties. Um, he used to sell. Uh, so the, in the in the seventies, he used to export Mac. Macintoshes that were like this big, two in Macintoshes, you would export them to the UK for about forty dollars a bushel of nineteen seventies money. And today, you know, a bushel of Macintosh is still thirty-five dollars a bushel. Um, so there's a huge decline in the value of your product. And that's been kind of the story is that for years apples declined in value. Um, they got cheaper. Everyone figured out everyone everyone just kind of drove to the bottom figuring out how to grow them cheaper and easier and simpler uh and then in the late 80s um the early 90s basically these massive orchards in northern china came online and basically bottomed out the commercial and like people growing commodity apple product to put into like commodity great applesauce um that, those those farmers mostly those in like western new york or in michigan basically that the market bottomed out because they were growing cheap commodity apples and all of a sudden they had people who were buying there's no market for their apples anymore and kind of went up in the market the entire time or even here in new england in northeast new england people were, people were just were selling macintoshes and they're trying to sell them for as little as possible that was the market um so in the last few decades now we've kind of reversed the course and i realizing hey like we need to 
really value these things. So we have these specialty varieties like here. Um, part of specialty varieties is that these are really unique and, and have really unique qualities to them that's not just um, apple and sugar. Like Red Delicious is the worst example of that. Red Delicious are gross, disgusting apples and don't resemble anywhere close to what apples could be or, or might be. Uh, which is sad because the original Red Delicious called Hawkeye is actually a really nice variety, but it's been destroyed over the last many decades. Uh, so now cider partly comes about because of of, of, the, of the economics issue again. We're looking to figure out how to establish real value for these varieties. So we're putting investment into these unique varieties like Golden Russet and, and Jonathan, and like by converting these th at a small scale farm, converting, you can't, there's no way you can grow these apples and then commercially make money off of them. Um, but you could put them into a value product like cider and then you can sell it and actually sustain, create a real business that way and create something for, for real. Um, among other things, it really it allows for you to, to, to do tree farming in a way that actually makes sense on a, on a, on a, small, on a relatively small, small scale. Um, and hopefully it's a, a bounce back and recovery from the kind of the worst versions of, of where apple farming has been going and was going for many years. Um, so I think it's kind of why cider is a thing now than not, not 20 years ago. And part of just speaking of marketability, the one thing too about just going back briefly on the success of the Hudson Valley as an apple growing region is the region is slightly warmer in weeks ahead of other competitors. So any other part of New England, it's, it's, it's colder, it's cooler. And they also don't have the ease to send their fruit down to the market. But the Hudson Valley historically has set the prices for for fruit, and and other growers in New England would follow suit. So they sort of the fact that they were a few a few weeks earlier because of the warmer climate really was a boost at their their accelerated success. Um, yeah, it really was a, a center place for 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 farming and agriculture, and, uh, and I think today and in, in, inside in the last ten years. Um, has helped give new light to a lot of to a lot of farms here, where like the prospects were pretty you know, farming prospects are so pretty big across the country, um, and cider I think allows opportunity for a different way of life that's better than the previous previous examples of how to do so. Look at like um, twenty years, thirty years ago, the innovation was you pick orchards, and that saved a lot of farms because it allowed you to. Um, Sell direct, sell direct, and allow you to maintain keep keep more keep more money for yourself. And and now, Cider's allowing you to create a value added product that allows you to give you more money for yourself. Which is why we're having all these nice tasting rooms and all these nice facilities and new things here that hop up in the valley. Because it allows for the farms little, that has more long term viability of your, of your agricultural prospects. To that point, in our own backyard, we're seeing it down in Fishkill at Fishkill Farms and Treasury Cider. Um, they're Commercially licensed, maybe around 2014 or so, or 15. Yeah. Um, but that farm is, they, I believe it started in 1913. It's a century farm, and having added cider on top of their UPIC as well, but the farm is, you know, nearly to an amusement park with the, the amount of traffic and the volume. A lot of humans. Um, the oldest operating fruit farm in Dutchess County, believed to be Rose Hill up in, in Red Hook, the Frawley family bought the land in the late 1790s, put it into cultivation early 1800s, and was in the family up until maybe a decade or 15 years ago. But it's currently uh, the owners are, are now uh, also making cider, and they're both Treasury and Rose Hill are using fruit from their farm as a means to, like Dan was saying, the value-added product. And both have found great success <coughs> in our in reinvesting know, in it with with the communities. Um, bless you. Thank you. Montgomery Place Orchards. Uh, is on Bard property, but they dug into Leia. Uh, Taylor in 1980s started planting a wide diversity of fruit. Um, so Jonathan and Golden Russet are both from their, their orchard, uh, but in the 1980s. And they're like 60 varieties, 70 varieties. Yeah, 60 or 70 varieties, as do up in Kinderhook, some mascot uh, outside the county. I really that many. Yeah, yeah. The huge, they have a huge farm, though. Yeah. But it's sort of just telling of, of the success. Uh, you know, continued and standing on this legacy of the past and moving forward and how, how can we maintain this unique, uh, you know, the, the specialty of, of fruit that we have in the Hudson Valley. Um, and I think with our discussion of cider, we should start to drink some for those who are interested.
Yeah, I, I, I think first is... Uh, some questions. Is there any, is there any, I don't see any Zoom questions. Are there audience questions so far on thoughts? Yes, in front. We have got the new, besides maybe tasting cider, the one time in your younger life saying, hey, I like this, let's make it. Or, I mean, how, how, what got you so interested in, in like, devoting your life Community. to it? Uh, she, her, 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 her question. Her question is about how how, how did we fall into this basically? Why why is cider as a thing? And for me, it was uh, um, I first came to cider through restaurants, and it was uh, my way that I used to run this restaurant. I I would serve a lot of it as a because it was uh, affordable. <laughs> it was a very high quality product. It was affordable for people to consume, um, and I found the community to be amazing. Uh, and the, the history, the community, uh, and the potential, like where we're going is really exciting and like such a fun place and the changes we're making and what's happened in the last, I've been doing this for about, for, for a number of years now and the changes that have taken place in that time period have been tremendous. So I'm just excited to see the journey that's going to come about with us. And to sort of echo that, it's the people largely as much as it is the product. It tastes great too, but it's it's also the people the it's it's boundless there's there's no ceiling um and we use a term in, in the book that borrows from actually the cider called liminal just to explain this sort of like almost you might argue permanently in transit this the cider is a shape shifting beverage it doesn't have uh confines and boxes and cages built around it it's very it, it's ex, ex, explorative and People come to it largely with that understanding because of this very unique and strange yes. and, and developing thing. Um, 1850s, Andrew Jackson Downing from Newburgh, he published a very seminal book, uh, late 1840s, that, that documented over 140 varieties. 50 years later, this book is an original from 1905, Spencer Ambrose Beach. There's over a thousand varieties unique to New York that were grown. Um, and just a couple years ago, a gentleman who lives in Iowa, I believe, Dan Bussey, yeah. has a seven-volume book that documents it's like 14 or 15,000 apple varieties. It's like from where Craig's hand is to where my hand is, probably. Is what and that's just to speak of the diversity of apples, and that's not to count the apples that we don't know names of, or the apples that are, you know, 14 minutes down the road here, they're sticking out of a forest um, that Dan Bussey didn't find. But the, the, the capabilities in, in wine... Um, there's, much more dog, the there's, much more dog, there's more dogma. The, and there's there's more genetic diversity in apples, but every apple can be juiced and fermented, and every apple variety is going to taste different in the sheer nature of the fruit itself. Speaking of the complexity of apples as well, humans have something like 30,000 genomes, and apples have double, about 60,000, so that's why they're not true to seed, and you might get a, an offspring that resembles its parent, but the likelihood is that it's just going to be completely different. And if and it's bitter and sharp, you ferment it. And there's thousands of cideries in the country. There's like there's thousands of experiments taking place and thousands of different ways of understanding it. And that's just here in this country. And it's happening all over the world. Now we're seeing huge resurgence of, of cider interest in, in Eastern Europe. Uh, last month, we had an amazing visit with some uh, couple who are here from Mexico City. We're talking all about um, cider making in Oaxaca that they're working on this project in southern Mexico where the apples ripen from May until November. And it's like, it's totally unique in that. It's like, it's a, and I'm like, oh my God, there's like, like I, I, there's like such a, like, and they, that they've made, like, I, I owned nothing. <laughs> like, there's no information there. Um, and it's just like a, it's, it's just so deep. Like, I, I'm excited about those Mexican, ra Mexican rabbit holes of, of cider. Who knows? I don't know. That's that it. answers. Yeah. That's a rambling answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's deeply compelling. I don't know. I've heard Macown more. Macown. Okay. Yeah. I I keep asking different apple people out there. Yeah. Please repeat the question. Oh, Macoon or Macown? Pronunciation. I say Macoon. Cown. Cown. Tomato. Tomato. I don't know. Yeah. No, the pretty. The, it's actually amazing. This. Oh, there's a question. Was the early orchard people proprietary of the varieties that they were growing in? So, so, so no. There's so much communication back and forth. There's a really great. Um, there's a great. Uh, in the first big Apple books, 
is called um, uh, William Cox's Orchard Orchard Makers something. William Cox, he's a New Jersey politician from like 1802, it's what you can follow from that. And he's it's all about, it's all about information trading and, and things like that. Uh, and during from that kind of like that time period to like 1840s, it's called like the golden age of homology. Basically, everyone is sharing and sending things around the country in this kind of this peak of these horticultural excitement of um, of sharing varieties around, around the place. Uh, and it's people are looking at both like collaboratively, but also like if you have a good variety, people were are willing to pay for it. So it was a bit of like a you know, these small farmers kind of growing and experimenting varieties and the idea that like they can maybe make it some money. You could, you could you maybe make some, some real money on this thing. There's a couple, um, there's a couple of apple breeders um, that are important. There are apple breeders, like, it's more amateur at that point in time. And then, like, by the later half of the 19th century, it gets a little more professionalized. And you get these, like, really prolific breeders out of, um, like, South Dakota, and uh, Edder, who's up in Mendocino County in, Cal in, Cal in California, or no, he's in Humboldt County in California, really popular. there. Albert Edder and Sin Albert Edder and um, he's in Albert, um, Luther Burbank, who's a uh, who makes stereotypes for the Burbank potato, what's up potato? Uh, he he like did that in Boston, sold it, and then moved to California, and then he has this pretty prolific career doing fruit breeding out there. Uh, it's pretty collaborative, I would say, to, to the point where it's going to be very confusing. People would send things around, uh, especially things like, like um, uh, wine sap, which is the wor is it, which is like um, which is the most confusing variety ever because of uh, everyone was sending samples and uh, very they all look very different <laughs> because of that. Uh, club, I don't know what I missed while I was in the walk-in. You were just saying, yeah, we're saying it, 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 old uh, collaborative nature of the, of old spiders. Whereas today there's, uh, we can do a quick segue about Honeycrisp because it's fascinating. Uh, the growers we talked to called Honeycrisp Moneycrisp for obvious reasons. Um, but that, so club varieties, and this is a ca crim Crimson Crisp. Crimson Crisp. And I'll show folks at home, it's just like compared to. Oh, crim 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 compared to, you know, Roxbury Russets, it's russeted in. But this is not a club variety though. Cosmic Crisp is not. No, it's an editor variety. Ah, okay, okay. Well, there you go, back to editor. There's an Albert Edder variety from the 30s in California. Oh, okay, great. Well, good. I right. It sounds, it sounds like a new variety, but it's not. There are some proprietary varieties being released from universities where they own the rights for 20 years and then... Cosmic Crisps. That's the one. That's the big money one they threw money on last year. Yeah. And the, the, some of these apples have their own websites. The marketing dollars and... There's a lot of money behind them. Yeah. Um, Someone asked the question. Too. How many... Apples to make a liter of cider. Ooh. Uh, how many? Depends on the, 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 the apples. How many apples to make a liter of cider? Yeah, I guess. Yeah, it would depend on if you're you're talking about this or this. I would say your standard variety would be like what? This size, maybe. I think um, twenty-five. I think probably twenty-five is probably a good. Couple dozen, depending on how you grind it, um, and then press, but twenty-five. Um, but but I, I think the the yeah, yeah. That's one. so we'll continue to take questions more questions more thoughts yes at home we're gonna Herb. how much the alcohol is there on Cox Snyder it varies so um, I would say the low end is five percent let's say um, the most of the cider most of like uh, and the question for folks at oh, home God damn. how much alcohol how, what's the alcohol by volume of the alcohol percentage in cider, and roughly roughly seven, but it can vary. Yeah, roughly seven, let's say. So like this is eight point three. These are higher. Um, most I would say seven percent. I would say standard goes down to the lowest four. And I'd say uh, most up here in New York, you find seven fifties are probably higher than that. This would probably be like this is Golden Russet, which is a very high alcohol apple, which is eight three, which is actually kind of low for that variety. Um, but it can be up up to ten or um, over ten percent, but but that's unusual. I would say seven to eight usually. Probably start with golden russet, right? Small batch. I would think so. Do you guys know if you don't? I I do, and I can say it. But do you know why people drank alcoholic beverages in the past historically? 
why people were drinking non cider, the fear. It was the easiest you could get a hold of. And it was like, it was a, 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 um, I hear you, forget that. Um, the question is why, I think just generally speaking, why alcohol was more favored. People, yeah, consumed alcohol. Can I answer it? Sure. <laughs> people, I think I'll just come up front. Sure, sure, perhaps. sure. I'll trade you my tea while I pour Just a front. minute, yeah. People drank a lot more alcohol in the past, and it's not because they were alcoholics. It's because they didn't have access to clean water. So all of these ancient societies developed ways to create a, a beverage that would ferment and thus with the alcohol be would be stable. And that's, that's why we had these. And of course, some, some societies were beer drinking, some were sake drinking, some were wine drinking, and then you have the cider drink. Oh. So I just think it's important mm -hmm. to realize, I mean, the, the volume of alcohol consumption well into the mid, like eight, up to 1840s and 50s was extraordinarily high. But then with the temperance movement, which began to be associated with religious um, and, and social reform, they started shutting that down. But that, that's sort of a my history lesson for the day. And I think uh, on top of that too, but then, so then the people, so the interesting about cider well is that the people who were, mm, cider is a beverage that it's, it's as zenith in the United States in that time period from like basically like 1740, let's say, to like 1830, which is call it that range. Um, but at the people who are the people who are most likely to engage in temperance were mostly New Englanders and like white Anglo Saxons who were here already. And then when newer immigrants came to, came in, they were uh, so people who are cider drinkers. Oftentimes, the cultures and people who are most associated with cider uh, were also the groups that quicker move temperance faster. So they basically abandoned it quicker. So then when we had, when temperance was, when the person was abandoned, there were other groups of people who are still into drinking wine, beer. And that when people, when white English Saxons decided to drink alcohol again, there were the other cultures they could easily tap into that were already existing um, that were just, that were really, that, that allowed them to tap into differently rather than trying to resurrect cider from a, 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 out of the grave. It's also a great way to get your crop to market. Right? Yeah. And the same thing with whiskey. You know, that, that would, that you, or, or corn, you, you boil down or you, you know, you can get a crop to market in its alcoholic or liquid form. More stably. More easily. Yeah. Then you can yeah. get in a huge form. But I'm getting out of here. <laughs> no, you're fine. Not, not my show. <laughs> yes. Was sweet alcohol, non alcohol. Sweet cider, non-alcoholic Yeah. Introduced for temperance reasons, or is it available all along? Yeah. Oh, it was available all along. Um, but like, oh, sorry, yeah. Um, the question, the question was about um, was sweet non-alcoholic contemporary? You talk about cider today available available in the past. Uh, the answer is is y yes, it was. Although very much it was a very seasonal beverage, especially beverage because it wasn't something that, would, that lasted or preserved because you didn't have. <laughs> So base that we have today, and we definitely didn't have um, kind of refriger refrigeration methods that we have today as well. Uh, and in terms of the vocabulary switch, so in our book we talk we use the word cider and we refer to we mean alcohol. Um, but in the there really isn't a, a, a real switch over from sweet cider to hard cider. Like um, in the past, you can read things and they're it's unclear if we're talking about alcoholic or non-alcoholic. Um, it it it's not clear always which one they're talking about. Sometimes there's sometimes in text they refer to it as non-alcoholic stuff as must or as juice sometimes, but it's not consistent. I would say. Um, so when you see like in 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 Downing's book in 1840s, he talks about cider, and it's not clear what he is. 
speaking of. There was a point that, that, that your question of doing some research, research somebody uh, mm. posed the question, when did the new coat become old? When does cider, when does fresh cider start to ferment? Or what point did the pig become a swine kind of thing? It's hard to tell. It's a very, very muddy gray area. It, it, I, I found this amazing um, course. Oh, Craig was saying it's very muddy in the history, looking back of, of when uh, sweet cider, if you leave sweet cider out, it will just ferment and become alcoholic. If you, shoot, you buy a gallon of juice out of the fridge here and leave it on the counter, it will become alcoholic. Maybe not very good, but it will become alcoholic all the same. Um, so Craig's point was that like in the history is very much like when does a uh, swine become, or the pig become a swine? And, where, where are these kind of gray areas? And it's much more, as I said earlier, it's much more liminal space of transition and in between things. Um, so I remember looking at uh, this court case over in Sullivan County where someone was being accused of, in like, of, in, during, tef during a temperance period, of like, uh, of, of having made alcohol and made cider. And he, he was claiming that he'd add some chemical agent to it that was definitely not going to prevent him. It was it was it was a stable element, but it was language is very unclear about because they're all using the same words. It's not very clear what they're talking about. But um, yeah, there, there is a lot of interesting. Um, there is some interesting stuff about this kind of switch over between uh, like alcohol and alcohol. Um, I think a uh, on a, on this point earlier about the not safe water. It's one of the, the things that the temperance movement put in is a lot of fountains. All these big drinking, public drinking fountains, they're installed in a lot of cities. Big fountains were done as a, as, as a, as a, like the, the big fountain that's in Washington Square Park in New York City is, was put in by the temperance society as like a drinking fountain object because it was like, because you wanted to create better access to water. Anyway, this cider is delicious. Which one is this? So, yeah, but. The two ciders um, mm. sort of chose for what varieties were in the cider. Um, they're both Hudson Valley. This one is 100% so golden, golden russet. This is our this is our boy Fabio. This is our namesake apple. But West Wind Orchard is over in Accord, and <laughs> Fabio bought the property with his then partner in 20 years ago. So? About, yeah, after 9/11, they were living in the city and got some land, and uh, the land had trees on it, and the the you do slowly got into Fabio more and more, and now Fabio is making cider full time um, and growing and doing really well. And for example, part of what makes cider so fun and compelling is that he didn't make this last year and years prior. But over the time, as he worked with Golden Russet, he found he liked how it expressed itself and thought it stood up enough to be a, what you would call a varietal cider, a single variety, that variety being Golden Russet. Um, and Dan has a wonderful palate and can speak more to it, but I find Golden russet, the juice and russet fruit in general mm -hmm. tends to be a bit honeyed and unctuous and almost have a, a richer mouthfeel. In the case of golden russet, I get a lot of baking spices and it's very savory. And, and there's just sort of, if you look for it or not, there's, there's a lot of nuance. Yeah, it. it had a lot of like cool stone fruity qualities to it, like peaches and apricots and like honey and those kind of flavors to it. Yeah. Can you explain some of those distinctions like wine tasting? Fruity yeah. Fruity? Or whatever. Totally. Yes. So, 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 yeah. I'm a, I'm a originally a wine human here. So, yeah. So, yeah. For folks so, at home, how to differentiate some of the the adjectives we're using to describe cider? Yeah. So, so thinking about cider, as thinking about wine tasting. Um, what I always think about it is to dig into the glass and think about like uh, fruit flavors that exist here. And kind of, I, I always envision it as like as a kind of like a, a pyramid, like a, a flow chart of like if it's like. This is a tree fruit. Is it like a melon fruit? I kind of go through my my lists of flavors and things, and I kind of think. Then I think about like like green things and living plants, and then looking to spices and herbs, and then other things, and kind of going through my rolodex of of flavors and profiles, and kind of going through my my web of words and meanings to kind of like find pick out adjectives that I really like and I think are really descriptive. It's not about like um, I find there's no wrong answer, and I, I find yeah. that tasting yeah. notes are are can get really boring sometimes when they're just like very repetitive, but like and I or just like descriptive in a way. I really like creating more me sense memories to them, tied to them. So like 
for this thing, I feel like this cider has all these memories of like of like uh, of like apricot preserves, like whole apricots, kind of in, in like a honey syrup, something like that. It's a real object and real real thing with like um, like clover honey and all these kind of really nice. Uh, maybe like some pie spice in there as well, like peach pie flavors. But it's fun to explore, and the way to learn is to just drink. <laughs> and it's fun side by sides. Often I found, and Dan and I worked in wine first. I found side by side is the best way to learn, just because you can contextualize and you can compare, and you have a direct comparison to something that you didn't drink a week ago. But and it feels nice. The cider just feels really nice in the palate, like. Cider is so pleasurable to drink because of the kind of diminished alcohol relative to wine, but it has that nice, those really nice flavors and the acidity and the texture it just feels so tasty. It's really nice. And this fruit is from um, 2019, so two years old at this point. And there's a lot of interesting laws and nuances of what can and cannot go on a label, but like a wine label, you can say right on the front, it'll say the vintage. And you can't do that with cider. But there's ways around it. And in this case, and back fine writing here. it's handwritten 2019. Um, and that's important. It's important for the consumer to understand when was this made and why. And, well, why isn't it made from fruit from last year? Why is it two years old? And in theory, we could ask Fabio, but he might say because the way that he made it required it to sort of settle down and what would be called bottle condition. After you put the cider in the bottle, you want it to become familiar with its new surroundings and it's still alive. There's still active yeast in there. So it's changing. And the longer in Fabio's mind, presumably it sits in bottle before the consumer gets it, you're gonna have a better product that represents the apple and his, his, his cider making capabilities. It's really delicious. Yeah, we're do yeah, yeah. Um, the next cider, and I'll go around when give folks a chance, but the next cider comes from Esopus and Kim and Matt made, so this is made from the orchard, on the orchard of the original Pell property in this opus. So there are some hundred year old trees. Um, None of Pell's trees have survived over the years. And but, this, sorry. No, so I was saying, and then this, this, this cider is from uh, the trees that were replanted there. So the Pell property, 1820, Kind of broken up over the years. It's a lot of those is like a bunch of big religious, uh, uh, like the Marist Brothers you know, thing over there. He's like a nun and a, now a large Bruderhof. All these big properties were on all the, the Pell properties over there. Um, and this is one of the old properties. Uh, and it, it, was, it was owned by who was the judge. He, he ran against McKinley, I think. And like, the, the, I think he ran against McKinley or. He, ran, he, ran, he, was a, he was the chief justice of like the New York Supreme Court, like that, and he ran for president against somebody and lost pretty horribly. But he's, he's owned this property at that some point, and then he, uh, I mean, that's when these trees were planted. So about 100 year, 100 year old trees, not as old as Pell. Yes. The varieties. The varieties in this are Craig, you know, the apple variety. It's, it's Ida Reds, right? Fortunes. And Empire. And Empire. Empire is more modern, though. Uh, I'm, yeah, let's wait. so this is a so what well, happened all golden russet? This is a brand of what we consider to be heirloom apples, or basically eating varieties. These are apple varieties that were planted with the intention of fresh market. Uh, Ida Red is a, is a Macintosh offshoot. It's pretty sorry, I didn't, I didn't know that. The Ida Reds, or? it's an offshoot, it's, it's from it's called Ida Red. Red is it's from. Uh, Ida comes from uh, Idaho. It's developed by um, University of Idaho. And they, let's call it 18, in the 1930s, what's, let's call it. About 1830s. Uh, Macintosh, Macintosh was a really big deal in, um, in, the, in that time period. Um, Macintosh is a weird variety because it, um, it, it basically doesn't, it's from, well, it's prolific today. It, it originates in uh, Ontario in like the 1790s, but, but basically no one cares about it for the next 100 years. Uh, and then it, it only really rises to the top in like basically like the 30s and stuff like that. It's, it's, 
Let me see it's planted everywhere. Yes, in the back. I'm tired of hearing this question when it's got quite a bit. Um, so Michael Pollan wrote about, it responding a desire, he wrote about John Neal. Mm -hmm. I remember the book mm. John Neal. So, like, so I know it's true because I was in elementary school, right? Just saying, um, sometimes kids kind of exaggerate and sound crazy. So, glorified. So, what is that story? Is that story Craig has that. So, the question, the question is uh, essentially, the validation of the the legacy of the myth of, of Johnny Appleseed, um, and he did he did exist. He was born in Massachusetts, um, 1745 maybe, 18th century, um, and he moved west. But I think he's largely taken out of context. He was moving west around the turn of the 19th century and into the 1810s, 20s, and planted mostly just seedling orchards. He was known to sort of collect pumice, or after you press apples, you throw the mash, what's left, into the field, or you give it to the pigs. And he would just collect that. The seeds were intact, and he would disperse the seeds, and whatever grew would grow. Um, research that we found said that he put up sort of like makeshift fences with shrubs that he might have cleared for the planting but he was never really by any means a viable orchardist and he was sort of living at a time when people were becoming that and grafted varieties were becoming sort of more of the known and people were starting to understand uh commercial fruit with less seedling he's a bit of a land speculator basically a, la a land speculator because he would basically he'd basically be He's had his operations basically ahead of the frontier. So as the frontier moved west, he would set up operations there and get rolling. But basically, as the frontier moved further west, um, other nurseries would come up with more grafted varieties. So, cause you're bought, and then with more grafted varieties, he would basically set these orchards up, and then he would sell the trees out. So as, you're moving, as people were moving west, they would, they'd, they'd arrive at this plot, clear land, and if he had trees in the cell, he would just buy you buy trees from him, set up, your, set up your own homestead orchard. But if you're setting up your own homestead orchard, um, buying trees off this dude in the woods, um, you're, his, his seeding apple, like Chris said earlier, his seeding apple trees might be anything. It might be delicious, or they might be gross. Like you find wild apple trees here in the forest, like sometimes they're good, sometimes they don't taste that great. And they're, and they're, good, and they're really only good for cider. So his, his trees are really only good for cider. Because like when people would, because um, if you're growing grafted varieties that you know they were, um, you would plant those and you could eat them or use them or sell them or something like that. But like like one of these varieties here, but uh, I'm assuming that one's a wild apple over there. Yeah. Or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Seedling. Yeah. So, yeah. Seedling things. Yeah. So like they're um, they're not something you want to would sell or consume or eat in a large scale. So. Um, he, as Frontier moved, he would keep on moving west and trying to find new, more frontiersmen. Um, so he created a lot of diversity out west, but there's not a lot of direct varieties that he created. And he's a very compelling figure because the, the question comes up a lot and he's very notorious. And we have a section in the book, kind of this breakout that's devoted to Johnny Appleseed and, and the, the myth and legend and reality. Um, but I think he sort of was existing and traversing the country at a time when uh, customs and social norms were sort of changing and people maybe had different ways of thought and they were becoming more progressive and maybe more whatever an urban environment might have looked like 200 years ago. And so here was this sort of, he's kind of a- Bohemian dude. Bohemian, he's, he's kind of countercultural and there's a lot of countercultural groups that live today that in, in generations in, you know, decades and centuries past that found a way to kind of connect with this this transient recluse that sort of did but they also also on top of that they, way. my ad says this but also so his culture is wild apple culture which I think is, is best epitomized by um is a Thoreau uh, article from 1860 let's say 62 a wild called apple. apple which is like an amazing read from the best apple things ever written it's a love letter to wild apples and 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 like and that's kind of like the close of wild apples at that point in time till today 
but basically it's a um, dry apple seeds legacy is one of wild apples and it's not really connected to the cultivated orchards that came after him but the history has always tried to contextualize him through contemporary orchards uh, and through the commercial orchards which is not what it is it's a separate culture but they just looked at him through this this lens of, of orchards and stuff. Yeah. From what little I know, and it's very little, I read, uh, I read a little too big of the book. But it sounds to me like Johnny Appleseed was providing seed apples that could be useful to farmers to make for cider. And they didn't, and they, they didn't care because they needed the cider to supply the family with some yes, safe but, drinking. But if you had, but if you, someone else nearby had grafted varieties, so like in the Midwest, you have um, the Putnam family. Let me just repeat for folks at home. So the question is, couldn't farmers or just folks adjacent to Johnny Appleseed's contributions in these seedling trees have used the fruit to make cider? And, and, and yes, but also like, but if you're that homestead guy, you are more likely to, you would, be, you would rather buy grafted trees from, so like the Putnam family, Putnam family out of Putnam County, New York, named after um, Israel Putnam and his grandkids or kids moved to Ohio and Marietta and they set up one of the big nurseries in Ohio. And you rather, and they brought a lot of their family orchard from Connecticut to That's Ohio. How Roxbury Russet got to Ohio is from that. And they brought it up to Ohio, and like, and you'd rather buy their trees, which which you, you knew you were you knew you were getting a Roxbury Russet, rather than uh, which is delicious and tastes good. And you can use your cider, but also could be used for anything else, rather than something that that only really only has. It's a hard, it's a hard scrabble existence. Right, right. People don't have money; they don't have access to totally grafted things. So this is just a you know a quick and easy way. It's, yeah, a thr it's a thrift it's a thrift to it, but the something. yeah, it's totally has a thrift use to it. But ult ultimately, this 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 well, one out. That's the story of cider, the history of cider. But it's not the this history is divorced from like th this died basically in the eighteen fifties, and story. this is what this is and 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 this left. So uh, we want to make sure that like that. Like and there is this story does have a place in it. Um, like uh, uh, Andy over in Aaron Burr Ciders and a lot of other wild cider makers around the country make really amazing cider from these trees. Um, but it's a it's a we don't want to. Uh, it's very unique and the ciders are absolutely amazing. But they're they're both the really important parts of the, of the entire story cider story and the modern. Maybe the, the convergence of where these things are coming together is that there's people who, and this is a large culture in the Finger Lakes of foraging the Finger Lakes National Forest and pulling, tasting fruit. And there's people that are taking cuttings from these trees if it tastes good for cider, and then they're giving them to people who have established nurseries. So you can now find, as of a couple of years ago, you could find, for example, there's an apple called Gnarled Chapman. Um, that is a great cider apple that was kind of, you know, rediscovered by a cider maker in the Finger Lakes, and he named it and gave cutting. Like the Eves, the Eves Perry behind Craig said, Eves Perry there, which is from the Finger Lakes. That's entirely made from wild pears from the Finger Lakes, and it is it's the bomb. It's so, and like for twenty bucks, it's like the best thing you're gonna drink. Craig, question. Uh, Barbara has some uh, chat room questions. She's going to turn on her mic. If you could answer the chat room questions. Sure. And then we'll have the the serenade. Okay. Okay, and to the Zoom audience, they've asked a couple of questions. One is, and would you repeat it, how many apples uh, does it take to make a liter of cider? Please repeat the question. Oh, how many apples in a liter of cider? About 25, we said? Yeah, I think so. About 25. But it depends on the variety. Yeah, the size of the fruit. But okay, and how many years can an apple tree live and produce? Ooh, ooh, very long. Ooh, interesting. So the question was, how long can an apple tree live and produce fruit? So, so um, it depends. So we have um, you got a, a modern orchard here in the valley, where 
fairly small trees. They're about you know, six to nine feet tall. Those trees will last about 40, 50, 40, 30 years or so. And, they come, and usually they're taken out because um, they're no longer productive. They've, they've declined in production, but in theory they can last a lot longer. Um, most trees here are large, most large standard trees. You grow a tree from seed, there are these very large tall trees. They'll last 100 to 200 years. They, they will. I think the old, there's really old trees around the country that still exist. Um, and pear trees can last even longer. Pear trees can last, I know there's pear trees. Uh, one of the most interesting, uh, interesting cider cultures makes very bad cider. A very interesting cider is in Austria, where uh, the pear tree, they have all these pear trees. They don't have orchards, but they always line the roads of the area called the Mosviertel in northern, in northern West Austria. And there are all these pear trees that are massive and huge. And they're all planted by, um, they're all planted in like the 1770s. They're all planted and they still produce. They're planted along the roads. There's not an orchard, just on the roads. They're planted and they, People harvest them and they have commercial cider they make from them. It's pretty dreadful, uh, but but which is a shame because the cult, it seems like it's such a these you know these trees are three hundred years old. <laughs> they're, like, they're up and they're, uh, they're out there. They're, they're planted planted by Maria Theresa. That's the I'm thinking of. Who had all these trees planted in like the seventeen seventies, something like that. Uh, and uh, but and the tree, pear trees are still alive and they're thriving and it's amazing. Um, I, well, I grew up in, over the Catskills, I, I, our trees were 150 years old, no, no question. It's a beautiful thing. Old trees are very majestic. Are there others for us, Barbara? No, uh, that's all. There are questions that I have at the time. Well, we will invite Jane, right? Oh, one more question in the audience. I have, I have a lot of questions. Um, this last one is, of the dynamics of the landscape, and we've alluded to some of this, but I, I was thinking about this. Um, over in Ulster County and up towards Kinderhook, we don't really see the, the orchards all seem to be full sale. They're in development or something at this point. So, orchards that are springing up, it's a two part question, I guess. People who are making cider now, where are they mostly getting their apples from? Are they typically the person who has that orchard? Is that the way it's working, or is there a market? Both. So the question is, where where is the fruit coming from for this cider explosion? Where people that are making cider, where do they get their fruit? And there's a number of avenues. Um, yeah, I, I would say so. And like, so there's part of it is developing out of those 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 people who are those farms are adapting themselves to produce cider. Like we call it treasury down in Fishkill, like Josh. They've been on that farm for 100 years. The last decade, they've added cider. Uh, and that's the case for like Rosa, which is a new ownership, or over in uh, Orange County at Soons, uh, or, or the Orchard Hill Cider. And it's happening pretty frequently where a lot of these orchards are looking to create a new revenue for themselves and embracing cider. That's definitely true in parts of Michigan, for sure, as well, um, or much in New York. Uh, that's definitely the case, driving it. But it's also but it's not the only story. There's lots of individuals and producers who are looking to to make cider. So there's people who are then setting up a cideries, not orchards themselves, and buying fruit from established orchards. Uh, that's very common and popular and very successful. And then the third thing is people who are putting in new orchards with the intention of making cider. Because a lot of times people who are buying fruit from existing orchards, those trees are planted for another reason. Like those trees are planted for, like for example, in, in, in Michigan, where it's most example is, Michigan's orchards are, are filled with uh, uh, Northern Spy and, and, and Rhode Island Greenings that are made for applesauce, basically. No one needs no one, the applesauce market is not what it used to be. So um, those trees are being re re repurposed for cider. Um, but it was, but they had different intentions. Now the new generation of cider makers are coming up where people are putting trees in the ground with the intention to make cider from them. And are those trees, they typically to be, are they typically the small ones like you're saying, 
Both. All of the above. Yeah, the size of these trees that just being yeah, um, are the, are the big planting small trees or large trees? And I would say, and the question answer would be, it, it really depends. There's a lot of both happening. Generally, the smaller trees are, are better managed, I would say, and you can get a crop on them faster, and you can do it on a lot smaller parcel of land. And labor and it's all that stuff. Well, it, labor at harvest is one, it's just, it's just a different system of economics to do so. Um, but that, to that, the point about largely the 1930s, 40s, 50s, orchards were still being planted on what was the more common spacing and practice with, with standard rootstocks, which give you trees that can last 150 years old. And they were about, I, I don't remember exactly, 25 feet apart, 25 by 25. And with that spacing, you get something like a thousand trees per acre. No, maybe not even that many. Uh, but you get very few. But the idea is that these large trees give you a bounty of fruit. But today's orchards are planting anywhere from two to six feet apart on dwarfing rootstocks, and you can get 2,500 trees per acre. So these trees are going to give you fruit in two to three years. A tree on standard rootstock will give you fruit in about eight, nine, but it'll last for a long time. This dwarfing rootstocks are going to be weaker and have to be replaced. They have to be trellised, but it's a quicker return on investment. People planting orchards today are largely planting dwarfing rootstocks for the kind of hurry the up. economics that makes yeah. more sense. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it will eventually. Ten years or the labor versus the labor on the ladder to get up there. Yeah, sure. it, yeah, it, it's yeah. Small trees are much easier to pick. Yeah, there's a lot of elements, a lot of elements going into orchard design, um, and there's a lot of things about how orchards really like play together and, and work. It's a there's a lot there, that, and like we're not sure yet. And because it means the limit. And when growing, our knowledge about growing apples, about growing apples for fresh market, and we don't know anything about growing apples for cider. So, like, the, the model always been small trees make sense for that kind of stuff. We're trying to make nice, shiny apples. But if we want to make cider apples, like, we don't need that anymore. We don't know. Anyway, Jane. thank you guys. So, my song, my song is about the presence of the Oh, lovely. All right. Um, you can see you can see you can see my 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 uh, uh my sheepskin. I'd like to introduce uh, Jean McAvoy. She's been a long time historical society member. She lives in Clinton Corners and uh she's been helping the society most recently as docent for our summer exhibit. But most people in the area know uh Jean from her Betty and the Baby Boomers group, which has been performing for 35 years. So here's Jean. Yeah, it, it, well, hello, folks. It'll be strange singing sitting down. But, um, so uh, many years ago, um, I worked as park naturalist for Dutchess County. And um, one of the things we did with school kids was to press up and talk about and um, I wrote this song uh, as kind of a work song. So it, it, those of you who have imbibed, if you're feeling like your throats are a little looser, um, you, can help, you can help sing because this song is very simple. It celebrates our valley, it celebrates apples, it celebrates this beautiful time of year. Have you seen a more beautiful day than the one we had today? Um, and uh, it, each verse is four lines. And the second and the fourth line in each verse is exactly the same. So after I after the second verse, you will all know the song. And um, I encourage you to make it a work song and sing it with me. If you people at home, you can sing too. And if you're feeling shy, just close your eyes. The room will go away. No one will see you. If your eyes are closed, no one can see. You. So here's how it goes. <clears throat> Oh, the days are warm, the nights are crisp. Turn, turn the apple press of all the year. This time is best. And oh, how fine are the apples. The geese are flying overhead. Turn, turn the apple press. 
They call to us that summer's dead, and oh, how fine are the apples. The lakes are misty in the morn. Turn, turn the apple press. The ghost of summer lingers on, and oh, how fine are the apples. But never mind that summer's lost. Turn, turn the apple press. Harvest comes with autumn's frost, and oh, how fine are the apples. The flowers of spring do feed the soul. Turn, turn the apple press. The fruits of autumn feed us all, and oh, how fine are the apples. And when we've picked and cut and squeezed, turn, turn the apple press. We'll share our nectar with the bees, and oh, how fine are the apples. And when bees and all have drunk their fill, turn, turn the apple press. We'll feel the warmth of summer still. And oh, how fine are the apples.